Welcome to this special bonus episode of the Grappling Rewind podcast. This bonus episode, we are going to break down Craig Jones versus Gordon Ryan in their ADCC match, as well as in their EBI match. We're also going to talk a little bit about Mateus Deniz in his upcoming match versus Craig Jones and his style and some, some of the history behind that grappler. So on this special bonus episode, we got Emil. How you doing, Emil? I'm doing great. It's good. So I figured we'd have you back on, break down some Craig Jones, some Gordon Ryan, and some Mateus before their matches uh, coming up this week. Absolutely. And normally when we do previews or whenever anyone does previews, they focus on the A game, how they think people are going to submit. In this case, we're going to look at the opposite. We're going to look at the last submissions that all of these uh, three grapplers have, have lost by. Basically how they got beat. Exactly. How do you beat these guys, or at least how were they last beat? Somebody had a really cool uh, series. It was Jack Slack or Bloody Elbow or something. It was was like How to Kill the King or something oh, like that. Oh, it's still ongoing, and it's pretty great. Is it Jack Slack? It's Jack Slack, and he writes uh, for Fightland. Vice. Fightland, that's yeah. what it was. I thought Fightland got disbanded like uh, recently. I th- I think they're still going, at least Jack for sure is still uh, making content. I loved his article. So we're kind of going to look at that. Like, how do you kill How do you kill the king? So what do you do to beat Craig Jones? What do you do to beat Gordon Ryan? And how do you beat uh, Mateus? So, Especially these guys being such excellent submission grapplers. And, and they've been showcased in these new events that are submission only. So it's interesting to look back and see how they were beat. All right, so let's get right into it. So we're going to talk about Craig Jones and Gordon Ryan. Craig Jones' last major match was against Rusmar Pajaris. Yeah, but before we get into this, I want to really caveat, like, this is the last submission loss these guys have taken, because we just saw Craig get beat uh, twice by DJ, Jack- DJ Jackson back-to-back. We saw him get beat at Spider, I think, in the Gi, where DJ just stalled out his guard, and we saw him got get beaten in Boa Super 8, again, by G- DJ Jackson the same way. So this is just the last submission loss that these guys have taken, and so uh, from what I'm seeing, at least unless I'm forgetting, uh, the last submission loss Craig took was versus Gordon in yep. ADCC. Back in 2017, in the quarterfinals of uh, their division, was it weight? It was weight class, right? It wasn't yeah. absolute. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, if we do, if it was absolute, then my bad. But yeah, weight class. And so, let's let's get right into the match. So this match was uh, back and forth in initially, where there weren't any takedowns. This Craig just sits. Craig always sits. Like it, if sits. his rule set lets him sit, even if it takes away points, he will sit. And Gordon does too, actually. And in this case, they went back and forth a little bit with sweeps, but it felt more like seating standing or seating guard. Yeah, and ADCC Mo- has that rule. Uh, there's no points till is it a ten minute match, right? And there's no points until five minutes, right? So there's really no there's no negative to not fighting for the takedown initially because there's no points. You're not going to concede anything. And so if you're comfortable from the bottom, Craig's going to pull. Exactly. So Craig uh, used a lot of X guard and single X, uh, leg X initially for off balancing Gordon. Um, you know, there was a, a lot of good movement with uh, Butterfly, but ultimately uh, Gordon sort of settled in and got comfortable um, and started executing a really excellent Butterfly guard pass here. And this yeah. is where he was able to shut down uh, Craig Jones's offense. This is where. Uh, Rusamar Pajaris was also able to sh- shut down. Yeah, really, Craig if Jones. in the butterfly guard in that kind of seated guard position, Craig is super effective if you can get under you and get your knees off the mat. Gordon will kind of throw through the um, the knee slide pass here and not give him that position. We saw this uh, versus Kalistani Grippo too. You brought that up earlier when we were talking about the match and what we were going to talk about. Um, guys that are predicated on heel hooks. Once you give them that space to get underneath you, they can just fuck you up and take your limbs off. So Gordon, the way Gordon passes, he never really gives Craig opportunity to, to lift him up and get get underneath him. And so Craig, I mean not Craig, Gordon just has an opportunity to kind of pressure pass with like a kind of like an over under, but a really high over under, like almost on the top of his shoulder. The, uh, the under hand. wasn't under the thigh where you normally would. It was more of an under hook on the arm, but it was still the same principle. And Gordon just starts smashing him. And in this case, all of his passes towards the end of this match, he had both knees on the mat more or less, and he yeah. was really attempting to again prevent that because, as you said. Craig Jones' main attack is the saddle position, and he loves to invert to get there. And if you can keep both of your your center of gravity low by keeping both knees on the mat, you're going to be able to shut that down, which is exactly what well, happened. You're going to be more effective in shutting that down. You're still gonna That's murder, true. He's still yeah. going to murder me. My yeah, knees are on yeah, the ground. 99% anything. of people are going to get <laughs> yeah, their, their but, legs taken. But at a high level, that seems to be one of the things that really Jones capitalizes on. As soon as you go through the knee up, like 
good luck with that. So Gordon pressures through. He gets up. So he has that one butterfly leg folded, and the the other one is up. And what he ends up doing is just grinding out to half guard. And it's around when he gets to Gordon gets to top half on Craig that Craig throws up the Nogi Ezekiel, which yeah. is a bold move, uh, <laughs> that's, especially that's against, lightly. Yeah. It's it's. I mean, uh, you, can give, you can get guys. We know guys. We've trained with guys that that do that and can hit you with it. We've seen it in the UFC. We've seen it, you know, all around. You see guys get hit with it, but I cannot recall the last time I've seen a high level grappler tap another high level grappler with it. And Craig kind of holds that for a long time, and it almost looks like he gasses his arms out a little bit trying oh, to stop sure. the pass with the Ezekiel. And Gordon's right hand never really needs to address uh, the the punching the top arm of. The Ezekiel. So it's really interesting. I'm not sure how much mileage that actually gave Craig in this position because you see him after he lets go of the Nogi Ezekiel once Gordon is passed, you see him kind of like almost like shaking his arms. Like his arms kind of high up and not to his body and kind of trying to shake his hands and arms. Very noodly. Very yeah. noodly. You can and see that he's really burned through his arms in that position. Craig's, look, uh, Craig's arms look exhausted by that point. And Gordon really didn't react to the Ezekiel. You know, he just kept. He just kept he postured up and he put the shoulder in. Exactly. Really Almost like a Von Flew, but not quite. And he was able to swim his legs out to get the pass to mount. Yeah, he uh, was basically a double center pass through the legs and then takes mount. And at this point, he has double unders and Craig's arms are just, uh, like I said earlier, noodling in the air. It looks really exhausted. And it doesn't take long for Gordon to be able to secure an arm triangle. And, and it he is just kind of blocks the arm up with his head, crosses it over. He does a really nice thing. We're not not talking as much about what Gord's doing, kind of how he beat Craig, but props to Gordon. He does a really, really interesting like slide across the body with his left leg from the mount position over to side control in order to finish the head and arm choke. It's if I have a, a small gif of it that I've saved on my computer from when this happened, and it's really amazing to watch the uh, the speed and the level of leg dexterity that he has to just slide from mount all the way over into side control with the head and arm there to finish the check. And it is a clean submission. You know, sometimes with the head and arm especially, you see the telephone defense. You see people kind of struggle and and prevent the submission, but this is a quick tap. Yeah, he gets he, Jordan cuts the angle, gets over, and then Craig taps. So going into this match, what, what are the things we saw Craig do that led to him eventually getting submitted because again we've seen Craig get beaten on points before so particularly what did you see him do here and where will Mateus be able to capitalize and what positions do you think Mateus will be looking for from a gamesman perspective where he could beat Craig Abe not you get the get the knees off the mat so I've been thinking about this a lot because why why is it that we don't see these high level grapplers get submitted that frequently they're really good they're really good and the thing is is that you need to take them to deep waters in this case this is the quarterfinals this is uh, honestly Craig Jones is Break breakout of oh, yeah, this is when everyone got who he was. Oh, he had exactly. Just beaten low. I think the match before, or two matches before. I forget. It might have been two matches before, I but I don't remember. Uh, I do know that th- those are deep waters. The ADCC tournament is very exhausting. You're you are fighting the best in the world, and it's also nogi where you, you know you, you can't just get grips and hang out and sometimes to catch a breath. This is a a very explosive event and he was very explosive against Leandro Lowe caught him off guard caught everyone off guard for that matter and so the you know this is also his first major tournament run so you have to wonder okay how conditioned was he physically he drank a beer before the absolute (laughs) I think (laughs) yeah okay so clearly his first rodeo um you know and did a remarkable job but uh I think you have to wonder whether or not there was a, a degree of exhaustion that that played into uh, played into this. So, if on a sing- so basically, on a single match, you're not going to see that from Jones. And we haven't really seen Jones gas out before. This is really like I think the most tired we've seen him. We saw him really tired in EBI again, a match we'll touch on in a bit here. Um, but I think exhaustion and like being tired. He did a couple things in this match that you do is Hail Marys Exactly. When you're tired. That's exactly what I was going to say. And it's not stuff we ever see from Craig. We have not, I haven't seen it since then. And in some of his earlier matches when I looked at before ADCC, you don't really see it before that. Like, he doesn't make those Hail Mary attempts at the Ezekiel and at the, um, he bo- at one point he body locks Gordon Ryan, um, I call it the white belt defense, in the mount, trying to just keep him down and keep him 
postured low so he can't attack anything. We all have those sort of exactly those techniques, the Hail Mary techniques. You know, if someone's trying to pass your half guard in the gi, you have that baseball, that sneaky baseball bat choke that you can try to get them with. Yeah. Uh, but if, if you don't get it, they're going to slide through on that exactly. pass. Exactly. It's, it's, uh, it's a last-ditch effort. You do it when you're too tired to try the sweep to try to get the better position. So that's how I interpreted the Nogi Ezekiel choke against Gordon Ryan, you know, a tremendous yeah, that was telling. player. And then for me, the body lock was telling. When he's in mount, he body locks him to kind of keep him down. That's oh, something yeah. you don't you don't see a ton. Exactly. You see, I mean, you see definitely guys use it. They get the knee through on it. They push the guy low. The guy postured up and they bump to get the knee through for that like heel hook escape defense. I I saw it more as like, and it more as he just knew his arms were exhausted and wanted to lock them behind the back so that Gordon couldn't isolate it. But clearly, that didn't really buy him any time at all. So yeah. So let's talk a little about Mateus. How do you see Mateus? What do you see Mateus doing in this match versus Craig? You know, given what we just watched with, with the match with Gordon. I mean, we'll talk about the EBI match here in a bit where we didn't see him. Actually, no, fuck it. Let's talk about the EBI match now. So in their second outing. We saw Craig win by was it overtime or was it choke? He didn't win. Um, Not he Craig. Almost, sorry, Gordon. Gordon won uh, via choke, right? Uh, it, so it was overtime, and that was the one where uh, Craig Jones had Gordon in a nasty armbar that if, uh, effectively Basically Gordon said that his, his arm. arm was fucked up, yeah. although he didn't tap. So Gordon got to win that one. But was it? What, how did he win again? Was it? Was it overtime escape time or was it? I think it was just time, yeah. Okay, it wasn't sure. I always forget because I always remember Gordon being in that super deep armbar and hitchhiking out at the last second. And then in the post-fight interview, um, they asked him how his arm was. And he's like, I'll know tomorrow. And I talked about it on the show when we broke that down. Like, if you say I'll know tomorrow, it means your arm's fucked up. Exactly. And so if you look at the actual regulation time, you'll see that Gordon was exhausted. This, as you just mentioned it, uh, Craig ran through everybody in like 90 like something like 90 seconds like he he's under a couple minutes on the mat for the entire ebi going into the finals and i think gordon had like an eight minute match and he had like a, a he had some serious time in and he was much more tired than craig in this match exactly this goes back to the deep waters that we were talking about in this case it was gordon who uh, was actually in deeper waters more exhausted although he wasn't during the regulation time threatened that much you kept seeing Craig when he was attacking. If he was in guard, he would invert to try to go to the saddle position for an in- inside heel hook. Try to lift Gordon's legs up. Exactly. Invert and then kick him up, try to off balance him, and then knock him over for the inside heel hook. Or if Craig Jones was trying to pass. Because they, cha- they change positions a lot in this match. It's a much more dynamic match than the ADCC match. And so you see Craig try to pass a lot, too, because Gordon will sit down and they'll, they'll go back and forth a lot. And then Craig keeps throwing the, the saddle position off the pass. Exactly. He, he doesn't even chain any kind of pass, really. When we say pass, we really mean that he just isolates a leg and then jumps into the saddle position as a, an immediate attack. So that's mostly what he's going for is that inside heel hook yeah, from the saddle for. position. Exactly. So how do we... So based on that, how do you see Mateus dealing with that? So first off, Mateus is not going to be exhausted the way Gordon Ryan was. So you're going to see him fresh. You're going to see, uh, and we know that Craig Jones isn't a, a takedown expert. So I fully expect We've seen him. We see takedown guys. And uh, like at Kasai, we saw him hit that beautiful, I think it was a Harai Goshi. So thanks for showing me that. That was a uh, textbook Harai Goshi. Unfortunately, I, I just can't. We see him pull. Like, we very. I mean, it was, I, it was a moment where they both stood up for a second and Craig knew he had a position to take him down. It was a scramble um, from a from a double leg takedown uh, by the other competitor. And I just don't see Craig going for the takedown against Denise, who's. No, I uh, see him doing what he always does interlace the hands and sit. Exactly. And so, what's the way I see this playing out is, you know, Denise is going to play a conservative game is my guess just going by what he does when he's at the top level competitions we at cannot Worlds. get his name right by the way Denise we call him Denise and Denise like I for the life of me <laughs> cannot figure out what the fuck the man's name is well Denise just cut you off right in the middle there Mateus well how about we just say Mateus. Mateus there we go I know I know that's his name and he 
Is the last time we saw Mateus get beat was <laughs> his what? last major match, which was yeah. Worlds uh, quarterfinal. He was uh, against. Uh, the Hulk Barbosa. He was basically beating Barbosa. Was on his back with a collar choke, and then, uh, well, Barbosa collar choked him. Exactly, and I guess he that was people were hoping for his teammates were hoping for redemption because Barbosa had beat him on points uh, at Pans previously. But we were looking to Mateus's record on this. Not that again, non sequitur again, but we've he's only been beaten at least for per BJJ heroes, which honestly is our pretty much de facto record-keeping system for jiu-jitsu, only been beaten by submission four times. And three of those are by Marilla Santana. Santana. And two of those were in the same tournament. Yeah, Boston uh, opened back in 2015. He armbarred him <laughs> in his division, and then he armbarred Marilla, armbarred him again in the absolute. And then uh, later that year... 2015, 2016. 2015, so... He uh, choked uh, him. He choked him. So it's been back since 2015... Essentially, you have uh, Mateus only being submitted once. That was his last major event, though this past Worlds Indeed. against Barbosa, he gets choked. And what the way that match starts is uh, he, you see Denis going for a uh, pretty conservative, pretty standard um, lapel underneath, essentially for the reverse de la Hiva. And he was he was able to get up for a single leg, take. Uh, Barbosa down, get to his back, and he had five minutes left in the match. And he has, I thought it was over. I oh. was like, he's on his. Or, at least thought like it was going to be a rough go to get out of. He there. had blow blood in the water, clearly, which is an yeah, awesome yeah. thing to see. A I'm, competitor in the deep water. It's so easy to say, oh, you got five minutes on the back, you know, ride it out. You got six points down, and and Barbosa has zero. You know, write it out. I was. I love to see that aggression. You could see that he wanted that submission, and he transitioned to a bow and arrow choke, and he just couldn't finish it. They rolled, and essentially the Hulk was able to get up onto his knees and pop his head out, and then they reset, and there was a, a takedown where um, Barbosa had his back took him down, got onto his back, and then went and put him in the exact same bow and arrow choke. It was a crazy back and forth at that point. Which So the funny thing about this, this is his last submission loss, and it's in the gi. So I'm fairly certain the Grapple Fest match with Craig is going to be no gi. So it, honestly, it doesn't tell us a ton about how he's going to get beat or how he how Craig can beat him. We know, you know, what his path is. He's going to pressure pass. He, you know, leave his knees to the ground. We know he has a much more conservative style and a slower style than Craig, who really wants to invert, lift you up, and go to that saddle and heel hook you. Uh, Deniz, <laughs> Deniz, Mateus doesn't really play like that. He's a much more conservative passer, much more conservative player, and he's really only going to go all in on something once he knows he's on it. It's going to be opportunistic, um, and I think it's going to play out a little bit, and we'll talk about this next match, but it's going to play out a little bit like Felipe Pena versus Gordon Ryan, where it's going to be a lot of shutting it down, and if you do see something, it's going to be really opportunistic. I don't see that happening in anything in in a in a, sh- a relatively short super fight. Do you see it looking like uh, the Craig Jones D.D. Jackson matches, like real, real slow from the guard? I mean, I think. How do you compare Mateus's guard passing to Jackson's guard passing? My question: Do you think we see a third match with Craig? in the guard or in the butterfly with no passes like we get a Paul Harris match or we get a DJ Jackson match. You know, it's it's when it's entirely possible to be the passer but not commit to the pass and just focus on stability and I see that happening. And now the the real question is, you know, this this has happened to Craig a, a few times now in a row in, re- in and recent history. In, in oh, very recent and you know, I just saw a headline of an interview with him where he says this this he's looking forward to Craig is looking forward to this match with Mateus to be really exciting and back and forth. So, I think that there's a fire under Craig. It's just what what do we see him do? You know, I I really hope that he does switch it up, doesn't just try to go from butterfly into the saddle position uh, as we've seen time and time again because people have basically people are hip to that and you know I, I think a lot of these competitors are completely content just grinding it out keeping their center of balance low 
shutting it down and you know if if an opportunity presents itself attacking there but you know what otherwise just just hanging out so on the other end of that how does so we know how Mateus beats Craig pressure passing keeping down keeping low really looking for the saddle position um he could do it like Gordon Ryan with the over under pass with that high shoulder getting mount how does Craig beat Mateus so we've seen Craig in scrambles he's incredibly savvy I think if he can generate a scramble uh, that is essentially where you'll see it. I don't think you're going to be able to see a systematic. He's not going to be in a pressure game. He's not going. He's not going to sweep to you know, uh, sweep to pass to um, to submission. It's going to be uh, a scramble. If he can get to the back, that's where uh, Denis has shown any kind of vulnerability. But uh, okay, literally two of his four submission losses ever at black belt have been from the back. Basically, if you're going to beat him from the back, history tells us it's going to be by armbar if you're Marillo Santana, or it's going to be by choke if you're Marillo or Barbosa. So what I'm hoping for is we see more of that. Craig Jones, who had that beautiful Hiragoshi from the scramble, we see something like that where he can capitalize off of it and get to the back uh, and try to choke. So you think his best best path towards victory is, you know, he's going to probably get into that pressure game initially. I assume, I assume he's going to pull at the beginning. Mateus is going to try to pass, try to pass, try to pass. And then at some point in that match, Craig is going to decide to really switch the game plan back to being more exciting. And he's going to throw something either unorthodox or pretty aggressive and he gonna, he's going to try to create a scramble in that situation so if we go for the legs if we go by his past performances that's how i would say it would go down but given that one uh highlight or rather one um interview clip that i saw where he said that he really wants to bring it I have a feeling he's going to come out stronger this time just because he has something to prove yeah we've also never seen uh Mateus lose to leg lock Right, or at least per the per the what I can find, um, I have not seen him lose by leg lock. Yeah, so it's you know uh, I I have a feeling this is going to play out a little bit differently from from the get go. So we just talked for like twenty minutes about Gordon Ryan winning, you know, m- mainly versus Craig Jones. But let's talk about the last time that he lost because we're going to see him on pans this weekend. Uh, on the other end, like how do you beat Gordon Ryan? And Felipe Pena is one of the few dudes to to do it as of recently. So they had a match. Uh, back in 2016, 16. like end of 2016, something like December, mm-hmm. um, in the Studio 540, it was an hour-long, sub-only, no-points match. And the first, mm, what do you say, 35 minutes of it were pretty pretty fucking slow. It was slow. I mean, there were, there were moments where uh, both people uh, either got a pass or sweep, but nothing that stuck. Um, Nothing you know, got. You never saw like a deep submission or like anyone was in real, real danger at any point in the match. Uh, there were maybe a couple, couple moments where guys were starting to get deep on something, but then they'd pull out and they kind of reset and you go into this pushing match again. So this is an interesting match to go back and look at because this is this is teen Ryan Gordon Ryan. This and, is almost two years ago at this point. It's two two years ago, but this is just he looks physically different. He looks not matured. This looks like a kid in a professional grappling match. This looks like before he got fucking huge. Well, yeah, this is before fucking Frosted Tip Adonis fucking <laughs> Gordon Ryan. This is Frosted this is Adonis. awkward fucking like dirty facial hair Gordon Ryan. Uh he's a little bit skinnier here. He's a lot bit skinnier. Yeah, here. okay. Yeah, I'm you know Fair enough. He looks like a yeah, right. He looks much much younger. Again, it's two years ago, so he looks way different than he looks now. He looks way different than he did in ADCC, even like I think a year later. Yeah, one year is a huge difference. But he was what twenty one here, twenty. Uh, I think twenty. Yeah, he was young here. He's, he's super young in general. Yeah. But anyway, what what we see is that right about the forty minute mark. And what we see is, well, even even before this, what we see a lot is Gordon playing guard, playing butterfly, doing actually a very similar game to Craig Jones where it looked like he was essentially just trying to get to the saddle every single time. Yeah, it does look a lot the same. Like they have a, Back then they have a really, really similar game. I think Gordon's game is more different now, but yeah, this looks... Having wa- just watched both of these, it looks really fucking similar. So I've been watching a few of the Dan Danaher Death Squad guys like Calistine, well, looking back at him, doing some research with him, and I see them going more for the outside heel hooks, the outside Ashigarami. Now I think it's easier to control, but this back then, yeah, we see the we see Gordon going 
spamming that um, the butterfly to saddle attempts. Yeah, and that entry, it's like his favorite entry back then. And on the other end of it, uh, Felipe Pena was, he was maintaining distance and st- when he was standing upright. And the moment they made contact to the point where Gordon could get, we'll call it the butterfly guard distance, whatever that medium distance is, you would see Felipe immediately get his center of base low. And we talked about it uh, just earlier. This is a, I think, a critical strategy that we're starting to see emerge a little bit now. And people talk about this fundamentally when you're talking leg locks and entanglements. You don't want them to get underneath you. So the best way to do that is to immediately drop your center of gravity. And a very great pass for that is the knee cut pass. So we see Felipe just drop into that knee cut over and over again, getting his knee to the mat and basing out. So even when about a 40 minute mark or so of the match when Gordon's able to get under him and actually get Felipe's leg he gets there a couple times but he's able to get there and you look oh no he could be he could be going for the heel hook Felipe does exactly what Vinny did two years later which is get up on his hands and get all the way up and extend that leg and uh, Mila and I were talking a little earlier about can you finish the heel hook when the guy is all the way based up like that the, in, that the inside heel the, hook. the inside heel hook from that position and I I'm not sure you can. It looks very awkward because you're you're for when Felipe is basically forcing Gordon Ryan into an inverted position, and Gordon Ryan is inverted such that he's supporting his weight on the shoulder that is the arm that should be finishing the heel hook. So that's super awkward to support your weight to try to invert to try to then get the actual submission to break that ankle, I, and I think it's it's very tricky. Yeah. So I think what we see a lot is people first knocking the person over, getting a, uh, a sweep of sorts when you invert uh, from the saddle position, and then once you get their butt to the mat, then finishing. Yeah, but you don't usually see once a guy's inverted, uh, the the defender has basically put his hands on the mat. You don't see that get finished as much by high level guys. So uh, Felipe from there basically ends up taking Gordon's back. To a series of magical jujitsu movements, <laughs> he he does a, an excellent job at you know standing up, keeping Gordon inverted, and then uh, he is able to stand up to the point where he he gets his leg free enough that he can spin around and get to the position where he can he he can basically he frees his leg by rotating it, rotating it out, um, and then attacking Gordon's back and you can see gordon is very distracted very flustered at this point yeah he, uh, i mean because Mate- i mean not mateus fuck felipe is on his back and they get into the hand he gets both hooks in because he has, initially has one hook and he's turned him sideways felipe gets the other hook in on gordon and then they start the hand fight the hand fighting you know was it was over in what five ten seconds it really was maybe not a little longer than that but it little. wasn't too too long because uh, sorry once the hook once the second hook gets in there's not a whole lot of hand fighting left because you see gordon's hands almost a little low and a little out like he's more spread out and felipe is very very tight and just punches a rear naked choke over his face yeah he gets it over the jaw there and just it it just looked terrible. Like I, oh, yeah. oh, I, I, I wanted to tap down. just looking at that. And he gets the tap. So, I mean, we've seen Gordon get finished by this, and we saw him get finished uh, by collar choke back at purple belt. <laughs> That's a that is a deep cut, but yeah, effectively in his, we'll call it in his uh, professional career. His prime this is years. this is his. This is his really only his his major submission losses is this one to Felipe Pena. Forty minutes into. An hour so again, long. Making him tired. But again, he's at IBJJF this weekend. Matches aren't 40 minutes. They're 10. Night Nogi's 10 minutes. 10 minutes for black belts. 10 minute match. Um, AJ's out of his division now. Grippo's out of his division now. So the big. I name, don't think either of those are going to be a threat for him. I didn't really either, but you know, you never know. No, not that those guys aren't talented, but they're really the, good. They're just the, not fucking the weight, huge. Yeah, I'm sorry. But the you weight do have a dude that is huge, Canon Duarte. Absolutely. And. Yeah. In hindsight, we should have pulled up some footage on him, but new black belt, Atos, world beater, world champion at Brown, pick your, I think, world champion at the other belts as well. 
um, monster from Atos. So it'll be really interesting to see Gordon coming back into IBJJF after a three-year layoff from IBJJF since Brown. No heel hooks. No heel hooks. It's the other question. So you beat Gordon. You don't beat Gordon by heel hook. You beat him by getting on the back. And that's something I really think Duarte has a really, probably butchering his name, Kanan has a really good chance of doing, of getting to Gordon's back. Um, we know Gordon has good D-bar finishes. We know he has good rear naked chokes. We know he has good um, head and arms. I'm sure his toe holds are brutal, too. Oh, yeah, that's legal. Yep. So you can D-bar, you can toe hold. Um, but he's really a heel hook guy, so it'll be very interesting to see how he stacks up without the reaping. My guess, we're going to see toe holds. I think toe holds are one of those sub- submissions that come on brutally quick. Um, yeah. And if if we know anything about these Danaher guys, they like efficiency. Yeah, and Ryan is good at the spin too. Like oh. he rolls through under very very well, which is something you see really that predicate. I would say the word predicate super bad. Um, that's what finishes the toe hold well. Guys roll through. Put the Josh says put the toes in the butt, and Gordon has the body style and the shoulder dexterity to roll over and get there. Yeah, and the, the toe holds are an interesting thing. That we see them occasionally happen explosively, and it's not a slow submission. It no. You can you crank this thing. I honestly, like, you see a pretty... I mean, heel hooks are the way more scary one and dangerous, but I want to say recently, like thing is i've actually seen we've I've seen, seen more dudes fucked up with toe holds yes like, like broken knees popped foot yes then i have heel hooks like I, I hear about heel hooks being super dangerous and youtube is full of heel hook compilations where guys get their shit snapped but personally you know, i have seen way more toe hold injuries here's recently. the difference i think you know with a heel hook i think the danger lies in the fact that you're not getting pain feedback right so i think a lot yeah. of those a lot of those injuries you see people like oh i'm fine i'm safe whatever they don't got anything and then pop pop pop, pop. exactly the toe hold is very different the you toe hold gut it out almost uh, or you feel like you can gut it out. i don't know man. i've seen some just just and i've personally i haven't you know, knock on wood, haven't been injured from a heel hook. I have gotten minor injuries from toe holds. Me too. And not, not because I'm not a stubborn person, but they come on yeah. so fast. And I think, I think in my esteem, they come on a little bit faster than, than the heel hook. You just don't, the turn can happen. A heel hook, you know when the guy has it and you can feel it extend. A toe hold, at least in my experience, you see a guy can get super deep and then start flaring it and it's already there oh and they come out of nowhere too you know you look at the 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 steam lock variations of it i love that toe hold by the those way. are I, I hate it I <laughs> it's terrifying to me because it it's it's it you know it's it's the leg equivalent of you know the 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 arm bar the that john jones hit against uh glover Teixeira where mirror he lock. just the mirror yeah lock. the mirror lock yeah, yeah precisely it I, it's to me the esteem lock is to feet what the mirror lock is to arms Dude, and it bunch comes of on lock. quick. I have a bunch of mirror lock victories at like blue belt you're, and stuff. You're and wrist lock victories a terrible belt. person yeah. and I'm going to step in for Josh here and remind everyone what a trash human being you are because that comes on way too quick to tap. You're effectively saying okay, you're going to you're going to have this injury. So, I think I think we'll see toe holds from Gordon Ryan uh, in this pants. Yeah. So, that's how you beat uh how you beat Gordon Ryan. So you know what? Because this is a bonus show, we're going to talk about Duarte. Uh, we pulled up his BGD Heroes record, and BGD Heroes only lists records, I'm pretty sure for everyone, when they get black belt, like black belt and on. And Duarte, in that time period, has 18 wins, 7 submission wins, and 3 losses. So the dude has a gang of black belt victories already, which kind of makes sense considering that um, he won brown belt worlds. Only in 2018... Does he have all of those matches? Since Worlds. Yeah. Like, since, like, half of the year, he has amassed that many matches and that many wins. His only losses are to Felipe Andrew. These are literally the only losses he has in 2018 at Black Belt. So, he's been crushing IBJJF, World Series of Grappling. We saw him uh, take, I think it was, he won 20 grand at that event a little bit ago in the over 81 kilograms division. God damn, he is a monster. He's winning by choke. He's winning by point. He's winning by he's winning by decision, knee bar, short choke, like worm bar. Yeah, he's a he's a monster. So none of those are submission losses either. So at black belt, we don't have 
No, no, he, he had Kata Katame. Oh, there we which go. Which is yeah. uh, what BJ Heroes call the head and arm choke. Hey, they're on that Danaher train. So, uh, actually, funny enough, now that we look at this, he has a loss from Kata Katame, which is the same thing that Gordon Ryan finished Craig Jones with in ADCC. Yeah. So, potentially, that's a path to victory. Now, given he has a ton of victories by by choke as well and by other things, and he has a bunch of points w- wins, he's also far more familiar with the IBJJF rules and scoring system, but I don't really foresee that being a problem for Gordon Ryan. I love how there's a whole division of guys that we're kind of glossing over for pans. Yeah, well, I mean... I really want to see this matchup. These are... we, we got to talk about the, the big names, right, and the big submission names as well. You know, like, we have... Johnny Grippo's great. Um, AJ Argazarm is AJ, whatever I mean, he's your great. opinions are. He's great, too. I would not characterize him as a submission technician. No. No, AJ's a dude that like, will grind out two points till the time runs out. Right. But and like, he wins a lot of matches with that. Johnny, also high-level competitor, wouldn't necessarily. I saw him this weekend. He fucked up a bunch of dudes at DC Open. Well, yeah. There you go. Yeah. It was good. He's, he's, he's at the cusp of, you know... Uh, World. Dude, he beat Shane a bunch last year, and then I think he got taken out by, um, I forget who he got taken out by, but Shane ended up winning the Worlds this year. But we did we did see him in that submission context uh, versus John Callistine not be able to get his game working. That was Kasai Pro 3, I think. Yep. And so, you know, well, it, I think... I mean, he's not in the division, so we're, it's kind of funny we're talking about him. He's in a different division, and I assume he's going to... Well, be he was in this division. As a joke, yeah. Yeah, well... Both of them were. AJ was in there as a joke, and Gianni was in there as a joke, and they've since done their athlete correction and changed divisions. Too. They're getting what they wanted, which is us to talk about them. Man, they deserve it. You're gonna you're gonna register for it, like balls. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Anyway, we don't get to see that freak show happen at IBJJF Pans, um, but we do see Kanan Duarte, and this should be a very very interesting matchup. So that about does it for our first bonus episode. Uh, I think we're going to be trying to, do, trying to do more of these from time to time um, when we get a chance to do them. I mean, there's cool stuff coming up when we have an idea like this. Record it put it out. If you guys are a fan of it, you like it, let us know. Um, yeah, what else you got, Emil? No, it's, I think it's always fun to have a detailed uh, preview to some of these more exciting, especially when you have a busy weekend, lots of events. You know, you want to highlight some of those really excellent matches from some of the really exciting competitors. I like how we're doing this on a week we have like seven events to cover. I have, this is the perfect time to do it because, hey. Literally, literally this week, um, we have On Invitational 9, uh, Men of War 3 is happening, Grapple Fest 2 is happening, IBJJF Nogi Pans is happening, and then on the show we're going to preview Subversive with Fight to Win. That's that uh, four-man, sorry, five-person because there's women on the thing is a four man team, like a quintet basically, uh, event with Tenth Planet, with Danaher. It's, it's a really cool event. Uh, also, preview King of the Mats, and then Amateur Quintet is going to happen as well. So. And don't forget that we have the September Sumo Basho going on right now, which, you know, is yet another thing that we have to cover. So, so many items. So, figures we're doing this on one of the most packed weeks in September. Just like, just add to it. Fuck it. So, you got anything else to add, Emil? No, that's it. All right, we'll see you on the mats. Stay safe. So that is it for our bonus episode. If you like more of these, let us know. If you like the show, please consider sharing with your friends on Facebook and YouTube and any other platform that you know you listen to the show on, please consider sharing the show. It is the best way that we grow the show and we really appreciate it. We reach out to us on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Google+. We're pretty much everywhere. If you want to get a hold of us, send us a message, let us know. If you've got an event coming up that you want us to cover, let us know about it. Thanks a lot.